Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. A-H-O. A-H-O. In a few minutes, two Equitable Society policyholders will tell you how A-H-O saved them from a mortgage foreclosure. A-H-O means Assured Home Ownership. It's the name of a money-saving, home-saving plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. It combines a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance protection. Result? A mortgage that's practically foreclosure-proof. So, please listen carefully to the Equitable Society's middle commercial on this program. You'll get full information on this ideal plan for homeowners... Offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, Apprentice of Larceny. Pick up the latest edition of your daily paper or listen to the news on your local radio station and you will have later crime statistics than even the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Unfortunately, though, you will only have the facts as they pertain to your community and crime is nationwide. It might be, if you live in a particularly law-abiding city, that a day will go by without a murder, maybe even two days. But while you are enjoying that pitifully short holiday, the American army of criminals is at work. Its members never rest. For when one sleeps, another wakes to take his place. And between them, they manage to murder an average of 20 people in this country every single day. In an era of large numbers, of millions and billions, 20 may not seem like very many people to you. But over the period of a year... And these are the figures as gathered for the past 12 months by your FBI. 13,010 people were murdered. If you are still unimpressed, then regard the fact that when D-Day came in Europe and millions of troops of all nations were thrown into the breach, when every available weapon was blazing, fewer men were killed. Fewer men than died here in this year of peace. in a corner saloon located in the downtown district of a large Midwestern city. It is early afternoon. A lone customer sits at the bar drinking beer. A young man at her. He goes to the jukebox, unlocks it, and removes the coins. Then he calls to the bartender. Say, Pete. Yeah, what do you want? Can I see a minute? Yeah. Yeah, what's on your mind? There wasn't much dough in there. Well, people just ain't playing the jukebox the way they used to. Why not? The television just as good, and it's for free. But you make money on the box. I make more on the television. Customers sit here and watch the fights for a couple of hours. Drink a lot of beer. Pete, you'll have to take it out. Are you kidding? No. Look, all right. I'll throw the jukebox out first, and you with it. Now get out of here. Huh? You heard me. Get out. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Huh? Did I hear him call you all right yet? That's right. That's my name. You any relative of Duke Albright? He was my father. No kidding. Uh Uh-huh. I used to work for your old man. Uh Uh-huh. You ain't acting like his kid, though. Letting a bum like this talk you that way. Look, mister, you stay out of this. Kid, you want him to take the television set out? Sure. Ask him once more. Ah, he's got his mind made up. I'll ask him for you. Mister... You're going to take the television set out? No. And you can pay for your beer and get out of here with him. Kid, now you make him take it out. How? You see this beer mug? 
Uh huh. You bring it back slow and let it go. Hey, hey. Come on, kid, let's go. Another drink, kid? Now I know. I guess I've been talking too much, huh? Oh, of course not. You see, Al, it's just that... Well, you don't know what it's like to be the son of a guy who's been a big success. Everybody expects so much of you. Yeah, that figures. They expect you should talk like him, act like him, and do like him. Well, I... I just couldn't be that. Don't you like larceny, kid? Oh, sure. But I just... Well, I just ain't like my pop. Look, Danny... Your old man started in 23, worse off than you are now. Inside of a year, he's got his own territory. I know, I was driving a beer truck for him then. By the time he got sent away in 29, Big Duke owned this whole city. Yeah, but it was easier in those days. It's never been easy, Danny. There's only one way to get successful. You gotta work at it. If your own man was alive today, he'd still be the biggest guy in town. With jukeboxes? With anything. And you can be the same thing. Danny, where's your family pride? Oh, I got that all right. Well, then use it. All you got to do to be a big man is change your way of working. What do you mean? Well, take that thing that happened back in the other saloon. You see the way I settled it? Uh Uh-huh. Muscle, that's what does it. You got to show him muscle or you get no place. But, Al, I I can't. I just ain't a muscle guy. Then I'll be one for you. Huh? We'll be partners. Gee, I I don't know what... It's good business for me, kid. You can use my muscle. I use your name. Only one thing. What? From now on, act like you're Duke. Duke Jr. I'll try. What do we do, Al? What do you mean? Well, the bartender in that joint was right. There's no dough in jukeboxes anymore. Television knocked it out. Then let's go into the television. Please. Oh, that takes dough. For what? The sets. They cost a lot of money. Duke. We'll steal them. A few days later, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Agent Michael Drew in the hall. Hello, Mike. Oh, hello, Jim. I was hoping to see you before I signed out. There's been another hijacking. Oh, where? Out on Route 11 between Ridgewood and here. When did it happen? Early this morning, about 4.30. Uh, any details? Yes, a gray sedan forced the truck to pull over to the side of the highway and stop. Two men were in the sedan. One got out, drew a gun, and forced the driver to step down. Mm-hmm. They tied the driver up slugged him and threw him into the ditch beside the road, and then the two of them drove off. Leaving the gray sedan? Yeah. Oh, I've already checked on it. It was stolen sometime during the night. Uh Oh? Nobody noticed the driver in the ditch until about half an hour ago. They untied him, and he called the local police, who asked him to contact us. Uh What was in the truck? Television sets. $20,000 worth. Uh Pretty good haul. I'd say the thieves apparently were looking for this particular truck, too. Why? One of them told the driver he was an hour behind schedule. Well, that might be an inside job. Now, we'll check on that angle, Mike. Oh, the truck was seen here this morning. By whom? One of the local police. That was before the alarm went out. Well, how do you know it was the same truck? It had a banner across the front of it advertising a truck. Uh-huh. Any description of the thieves? No, not yet. The driver couldn't give them to me over the phone because the doctor was just about to start treating him. Uh, wh- where is he now? He's at Central Hospital. I'm going over there now to see him, Mike. Uh, look, why don't you stay here and see if anything comes in on that alarm on the truck, huh? Okay. As soon as I'm finished with the driver, I'll be back. Now, here's a little gadget which should find its place in the kitchen of every home. Let me show you a few of its features. See the handy action? Danny. Yeah? What are you doing? Watching a television. Note the compact size. What's this? If this guy goes shopping for things. It's real interesting. Here we have the four stowaway shelves, an invaluable aid to all housewives. 
Why don't you tune in a fight? The fights are only on at night, Al. In the daytime, it's this guy? Oh, no. Sometimes it's a woman shopper. Turn it off. Okay. Uh, we still got a dozen sets to paint yet. Think we'll have any trouble getting rid of them? Kid, we don't get rid of them. We rent them. That's the whole idea. For saloons and stuff, you mean? That's right. First thing we do is cut up the town. How? In the districts, the way we used to do it in the old days. Oh. Then we put a guy in charge of a territory. It's his job to see that our television set goes into every saloon in this section. He's like a lieutenant. Uh-huh. Over them, you got to have captains. And over the captains, you got two guys running the whole thing. That's us. And once we get the television racket running, we'll move in and take the horse room business. We'll really operate, kid. We'll have big apartments, dames, banquets. And it... Hey. Speaking of banquets, we better eat something. Go out and get us some hamburgers, kid. You got any dough? No. Neither have I. Yeah, put the guy on the cuff for it. Okay. Hey, where do you think we ought to plant the first set? Uh, uh, what's the name of the place where I met you? Pete Craig's. He gets the first one. Tied up in court, Jim. Oh, that's all right, Mike. My calendar is pretty clear now. Good. Oh, did you happen to uh, go by the teletype room? Yeah. Uh, nothing's come in on that truck if that's what you're looking for. Yes, it was. So you were in court when I heard from Washington, weren't you? I guess I was. Now, you remember my going to the hospital to get a description from the driver of that truck? Mm-hmm. Well, I sent the description he gave me to uh, one of the bandits to our eye dent section, asked them if they had anything that would help. And they did? Well, they sent back five photographs from the general appearance file. I took them up to the hospital, and the driver identified one of them as one of the bandits. Who was he? A man named Al Harrison. Oh, I don't think I know that name. Well, there's no reason why you should, Mike. He's been in jail for the past 20 years. Oh. He used to drive a beer truck during Prohibition. Mm. What did he get sent up for? Bank robbery and attempted murder. He shot his way out of a trap one night and wounded a policeman. Mm. Fortunately for him, the policeman lived. So a kind-hearted jury convicted him with a recommendation for mercy. Uh-huh. Anything in Harrison's record that'll help us in this case, Jim? Oh, I'm waiting for the file room to send it in now. As soon as it gets here, let's both study it and see if we can get a lead. Yeah, well, the only customer Pete Craig had just left. Good. Let's take the set in. Okay. I can handle it. Okay, I'll hold the door. All right. Let's go. I'll go ahead and get the saloon door. Right. Come on. Hello, Pete. What are you doing back here? I brought you a new set. What? Here's a television set to take the place of the one I busted. I put it on the bar, huh? How do you like it, Pete? Better than the other one, huh? Well, I must say, I didn't expect this. What do you mean? I was swearing a warrant out to you guys. Yeah, I'll call it off now. Let me buy you a beer. Okay, Pete. Uh, you got any brandy? A new television set? Sure. We'll hook it up for you, Pete. No, 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 don't bother. One of my customers is in the business. He installed the other set. You pay him a service charge and he keeps it in shape for you. We'll take that job off his hands. What do you mean? We're the guys that service this set. That's part of the deal. Now, wait a minute. You just gave me the set, didn't you? Sure. But we charge by the week for keeping it up. Yeah, I might have known. Well, take it out. I don't want it. You've got no choice. Either you take the set, or tomorrow you've got no saloon. Well, who do you think you're scaring? Hey, Al, maybe, maybe we should make it easier, huh? I'll handle this, Duke. You'll handle nothing. Now, let me tell you something. I had all I wanted you guys 20 years ago. Times have changed now. You old-time has can't get away from... Oh. has been Come on, get up and give us the first week's payment in advance. Al, he cracked his head pretty hard. You feeling sorry for him? No, but I don't think he's going to pay it. Why not? Because he ain't breathing. 
When you ain't breathing, you're dead. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now, another type of home protection. A typical case from the files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Let Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Ormond tell you about it. About four years ago, I, I had to spend two months flat on my back in the hospital. Well, you know what that costs these days. Ralph, that's my husband, didn't know where he was going to get the money to carry the mortgage on our home. Then one day I was talking to Ed Newcomb, my Equitable Society representative. Ed tells me that's what the cash fund in my assured home ownership plan is for, to help out in emergencies that threaten home ownership. Well, that cash fund really saved our home for us. The Ormans didn't have just an ordinary mortgage. Their Equitable Society assured home ownership plan combined a low-cost first mortgage with life insurance protection. A growing cash fund was created, which can be used whenever sickness and unemployment threaten home ownership. That cash fund can also be used to pay off the mortgage way ahead of schedule. Right. Many 20-year mortgages have been paid off in about 15 years. Furthermore, under the assured home ownership plan, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society not only cancels the mortgage, but also returns to the widow every dollar her husband had paid to reduce the principal. Finally, during its life, the mortgage draws interest at only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So, for many reasons, a man may consider himself lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home enable him to qualify for an equitable assured home ownership plan. For full information, see your Equitable Society representative or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Apprentice of Larceny. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has cooperated in bringing this dramatization to you tonight because it wants to make sure that you are not among those who favor the popular misconception that the gangster, as we in the United States knew him in the Prohibition era, is an extinct animal. Nothing could be further from the truth. He not only lives among us today, but in some places he is present in even greater numbers than before. In great measure, the job of exterminating these gangsters belongs to the various law enforcement agencies. But in some part, the responsibility for getting rid of them is yours, too. For you, the law-abiding citizens, are the ones who comprise our juries, the ones who tell our judges how severely you want criminals dealt with. In recent weeks, a man resisting capture killed his wife and three police officers before being killed himself. A review of his previous record showed that he had been tried once before for murder, had been convicted, and had been sentenced on recommendation of the jury to a term of but three years on the reduced charge of manslaughter. It is the duty of every citizen when called for jury duty to face the facts and be governed by the evidence. If he honestly thinks a man on trial is innocent, it is his bounden duty to so vote. However, it is wrong to let any false sympathy enter into his deliberation. If he feels that the evidence presented warrants it, then his duty to himself and to everyone else is to vote for one verdict and one verdict only. Guilty. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. I was hoping you'd be back here, Mike. Why, Jim? What's up? I just got through down at the morgue. What were you doing down there? Well, the body of a bartender was found in a saloon at 9th and Adams. I'm pretty sure he was murdered by Al Harrison and his accomplice. Oh, why? Well, there was a new television set on the bar in the saloon. Part of the loot? Yeah, I had the set brought back to the lab. They examined one of the panels and brought up some serial numbers that had been filed off. I also got some prints off the chassis of the set. I didn't said they belonged to Harrison. 
Well, you've gotten a lot accomplished, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, not soon enough to save that bartender from being murdered, though. I got a lead on who Harrison's accomplice might be. Oh, how'd you do that? I looked up Harrison's record and found out where his regular hangouts were before he went to jail. Yeah. Most of them were closed, of course, but a few of them were still running. I checked and found that he'd been back. With his friend? Yeah. I got a description of the friend and looked up the local police records. Oh, did you find anything? No, no, not at first. Then I remember that one bartender told me that Harrison had called his friend Duke. Uh, hey, how about our nickname file? Yeah, that's where I went. Oh. I found the description fits a young hoodlum named Duke Albright. Duke Albright? Well, his father was a gang leader back in the 20s. Yeah, I know. Well, all we have to do now, Mike, is find young Albright and Harrison. Look at the television. What's on now? Them are puppets. Oh. Uh, where's the shopping guy? He comes on after the puppets. Sometimes I wonder why we stole these things. Turn it off, kid. But I want to see how it comes out. Look, that's the last set. As soon as we get it back in the crate and out in the truck, we move. Move? Where? Out of town. But what happens to the territories? Huh? The districts with the lieutenants and the captains. Well, we worked out again in the next place. Again? We never even got started here, Al. Look, do you want to stay partners? Well, sure, but I don't... Well, I don't start any trouble. Give me your hand with this set. Where are we going, Al? We'll head west. There's a lot of good towns at the other end of the state. We'll move the sets into a place, divide the town up into territories... And then we have lieutenants and captains. And and... we're the head of the whole thing. That's right, you. I'll go out and get the hamburgers now, Al. Special Agent Drew speaking. Jim Taylor, Mike. Oh, hi, Jim. Anything come in on the alarm? Only one thing. That was a maybe. Oh, what was that? A man called in a little while ago. He said his boy told him he saw the truck. The one we're looking for? That's right. Where? On 12th Avenue and 58th Street. The boy is very young, Jim, so there's no telling whether he's trying to attract attention to uh, himself. Mike. And... Mike, I think the boy might be right. Oh, why? Well, I'm at Danny Albright's apartment now. How'd you get there? I thought the address in his record turned out to be a vacant lot. Well, I took a chance and went down to police headquarters and checked their file on traffic violators. Uh-huh. You found Albright's name there? His name and correct address. Good. Did you find anything at the apartment? Well, nothing that looked like a lead by itself, but added to what you got, I think we might have something. What is it? Well, I found a book of matches here. They're from a beanery at 59th Street and 12th Avenue. That's one block from where the boys saw the truck. That's right. Sounds like they kept the truck near there, huh? Yeah. Mike, can you meet me right away? Sure, where? Oh, I'll pick you up in front of the office in, say, uh, ten minutes. I'll be waiting. And we'll go up to that neighborhood and check every garage. <laughs> garage on this block, Mike. I know. Looks like it's a private garage, too. If it is, we're probably out of luck. I'm afraid so. Don't look like there's anybody around. Uh, oh, come on, let's go in. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, thanks. Anybody here? Doesn't sound like it, Jim. No. Let's take a look around. Okay. Mike, I think we came to the right place. Here's some sales tags, and every one of them is from a television set. Jim, I think we just missed them. Oh, why? These oil spots here on the floor, no dust in any of them. Yeah. How about sending out a new alarm on that truck? Hey, wait a minute. What? Uh, let me see the description of that truck again, will you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, here it is. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Come on, let's get out to the car, Mike. Where are we going? I think I know which road they took. Come on. Duke, I got nothing to worry about now. We're out of the city. These country cops ain't gonna give us any trouble. How do you know? I know the road. 
This is the one I used to drive when I was delivering beer for your old man. Oh. Oh, hey. Hey, you see that house up ahead on the right? Uh-huh. Fred Smith, the bookmaker, used to have his office there. One night, my brother Harry decided to crack Smitty's safe open. So I let him ride with me, and I waited for him. Pretty soon, I see Harry coming out the front door. <laughs> and he's wheeling the safe in front of him. What'd he do that for? He couldn't get it open, so he took the whole thing. We put it in the truck and took it along. How'd he finally open it? He called Smitty and told him he had the safe and made a deal with him. If Smitty would tell him the combination, he'd bring the safe back. Well, did he? Sure. Safe was worth about a G. We delivered it the next night. Hey, what are you slowing down for? Now, that's a weighing station up ahead. What's that? Well, they weigh the truck. Why? There's a law. You ain't allowed to have more than a 20,000-pound load. What do they do if you're over? Give you a ticket. All right, Harrison. Uh, Come on down. You two, Albright. We're special agents of the FBI, and you're both under arrest. for larceny from interstate shipment. Both Al Harrison and Danny Albright were turned over to local authorities. They were tried and convicted on the more serious charge of murder. The two criminals in tonight's case from the files of your FBI were apprehended because Special Agent Taylor knew that the only road by which the truck could travel was Route 11. Every other road leading out of the city had either a railroad or a highway overpass which was too low to permit passage of that bigger truck. He also knew that Al Harrison had once driven a beer truck and that he would know about Route 11 being his sole avenue of escape. Because the two special agents had no way of knowing whether or not Harrison and Albright were armed, and also because they did not want to risk a possible gunfight in which an innocent person might be shot, they decided to wait at the weighing station. And so, two more criminals who joined forces after a chance meeting a meeting which resulted in the death of the bartender, had their illegal careers ended. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word to homeowners about the kind of mortgage you get in the Equitable Society's Assured Homeownership Plan. First, it's a mortgage that's practically foreclosure-proof. Right. If the owner dies, the mortgage is automatically canceled. During his life, the cash fund protects against emergencies such as illness and unemployment. Second, it's a mortgage that draws interest at only 4%. So, what are you waiting for? See your Equitable Society representative soon. For full information about the Assured Homeownership Plan designed for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A graphic account of the exploits of an escaped convict. Its subject, Manhunt. Its title... The Swampland Fugitive. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Whitfield Connor, Hal Dawson, Herb Ellis, Tony Hughes, and Ed McDonald. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swampland Fugitive on this, 
is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.